Thank you very much. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to argue that typology does have a key role to play in relational approaches. I'm going to explain how I understand the interplay between typology and relational theory, assemblage theory in particular. I'm going to do that by focusing on a concrete example of typology in action, focused around this newly discovered object. Um, I'll start by explaining which theoretical concepts I think uh, do and don't need to be invoked when we use the term typology. Typology has been described as tyrannical, reducing or erasing differences between objects, making the subjective seem objective, the tentative certain, the complex simple. In relational theory, particularly Deleuzean approaches, stressing the specificity of things, it's been argued we should reject typology. The problem with the traditional understanding of typology is that it posits an essential form carried as a mental template, which is then created pretty faithfully in each instance of that type. Conventionally, typology measures extensive properties of things to see if they fit with one type or another, the height, the width, etc. By contrast, Deleuzean approaches understand things as existing in diverse populations and focuses on their intensive properties, their character, affordances and effects. In my view, we can adopt this, uh, such a stance without doing away with typology as a term and method. We just need to work with a clearly relational understanding of what types and typologies are, and I think um, much archaeology does. We can combine appreciation of extensive properties with explorations of the intensive properties that things have. Typology can therefore be situated within a broader relational approach rather than used as a foil set up in opposition. Now Gavin Lucas <coughs> presents what I think is a strong explanation for the existence of types from an assemblage-based perspective. He argues that objects in a series are produced by similar productive assemblages. The sequential coming together of a potter's hand uh, and gestures um, clay, a bone cone, crushed stone, a remembered motif, and so on, was similar to, for each pot in the series. The type and typology conventionally refer to things and persons, but in this use of assemblage theory, we shift to talking about a type of an event <coughs> with an enduring product. Each event was different to those before, but had um, similar di um, sufficiently similar dimensions of productivity, and product to allow any differences in, say, pot decoration to be appreciated amongst those encountering that object, each of those objects. From the same perspective, archaeological typologies um, are produced by archaeologists working with the enduring remains of these past events, some of which exhibit patterning as types. Typologies are therefore archaeological attempts to grasp the presence of past types of actions. They involve a complex array of apparatus, methods, and theories, each of which shapes the typology. Typologies change over time as the working practices of the archaeologists change. An existing typology can be questioned and modified as we perceive a new relationship between form, substance, decoration, use, and date, for instance, or as we question presumptions about cultural boundaries or interaction that shapes a certain typology. Now, these are all relations that constitute each typology. And typologies are one tool for appreciating relationships that gave rise to past things. Now, clearly also, um, types change over time. They're not, they're, um, they're not static. There are periods of more and less um, typological coherence. <coughs> um, a, an object of a type draws a connection with the past, with previous similar things, and accentuates the small differences that show up against a similar background. And type of types of the century. Furthermore, some relations cross types. Each type of thing develops in relation to other types of thing. Um, and uh, this might be similar types of things, such as um, of other kinds of pottery. Um, as Mike said, clay is very plastic. The early Bronze Age pots are generally restricted in their de design and decoration choices. Beakers and food vessels, food vessels and, co and collared urns, um, the forms both cohere into types and yet also play off one another locally and differently over time. Some design elements cross vessel types, whereas others um, seem to be more in contrast. And this kind of riffing between types is important, and through detailed local studies we can try to grasp 
whether such citation is um, oppositional, uh, acquisitive, appreciative. And this applies to burials as much as it applies to objects. Sometimes specific dimensions of burial practices correlated with certain object types, and other times uh, they did not. So, for instance, short-necked beakers in north and eastern Britain um, are often burialed with crouched inhumations on east-west orientations, and Alexandra Shepherd has shown that bodily orientation within such burials was probably gendered across a large area. Burials with daggers in the same period were usually with adult males. Also, orientation, um, patterning and correlation with gender, and sometimes artifact types, became fuzzier and more localised in later centuries, um, including with food vessel pottery. Such changing correlations denote knowledge about a range of possibilities and pattern selection from that range, sometimes at a local scale, sometimes at larger scales. In explaining these patterns, conventional uses of typology often focus on cultural groups, cultural affinity, social and political connections, and hierarchies of access to resources. Now, these concepts um, can be useful. They can also be problematic. <coughs> but in either case, they may form part of a good explanation, but they do not necessarily give the whole story. Types of things had desirable experiential effects. We clearly need to consider relations of memory, experience, and personhood. And I think typology has a crucial role to play in doing this, which will remain underdeveloped if we don't rethink and also revalue typology. And I say we, I might be talking about myself more than you. Um, OK, so this is the project that I'm currently um, involved in, um, along with um, Rachel Crelling um, and an assorted team of people. Um, most particularly Michelle Gamble, who's discovered the objects that I'm going to be talking about uh, now, and it's funded by um, Manx National Heritage and Culture Vannon. Now, Michelle found a collection of bone objects that nobody had noticed before in a set of cremated remains. The discovery of these objects compelled me to sift through early Bronze Age object typologies. And I want to explore how this very conventional practice helps interpret an early Bronze Age burial from the Isle of Man. Think about where it falls short and situate it within um, my broader relational perspective. And we've only just found these things, so please do uh, bear in mind that these um, are not going to reach an awful lot of conclusions, and what I have to say is provisional. <coughs> a kist at Starvey Farm was uncovered during ploughing on the Isle of Man in 1947 and excavated rapidly by Basil Magore. The details of the excavation were not published until 1999, when Jenny Woodcock drew together Magore's notes and examined the objects he identified during the excavation. That report details two inverted urns, a plano convex flint knife, and a flint scraper, and a mass of cremated bone from within the urns and the kist, and exactly where it's not always um, properly specified. One of the urns was certainly a collared urn, and it's, um, it was inverted, and the mouth of the urn was hemmed with nine pebbles, uh, all but one of which were quartz. <coughs> the bones from this burial had never been assessed before until Michelle examined them. Some of them had not been cleaned, although they had been sorted into different bags in a way we can't now relate to the excavation. Michelle has identified the remains of at least four people from amongst these remains, two adults, an adolescent and a child, possibly very young. Um, this object on the left here is uh, a bone pommel from the end of a small knife, which would have had a copper alloy blade. Now, unlike Mike's pots, very few of these survive over a very wide area. There's around 40 bone pommels from daggers and knives across the British Isles, and there's about uh, 20 of this exact type, which Needham calls uh, class three bone pommels. Um, ours is one of the smallest. Needham has suggested the smaller ones were fitted to knife daggers, um, which, are often which are found with burials of men and women, in contrast to daggers, um, which tend to occur with adult males, and um, probably from uh, generally from <coughs> slightly earlier. Um, Woodward and Hunter's study of the wear marks on 19 of the known 40 pommels of various classes suggests they were heavily worn before burial. Like the Starvey pommel, a number of these were also broken. In some cases, the broken edges were smoothed, suggesting reuse on other handles. But in, cases, in some cases, like Starvey, it seems that they were detached from the hilt before being placed um, on the funeral pyre with the cremated remains. Now, these objects share not only a type of form, 
shaped early in their life course, but a type of treatment towards the end of that life course. Class three pommels all have this same form. That's the point of the classification. But there are differences in size, and there are differences in material. Um, in material. 14 of the class three pommels were made in bone or antler. And Woodward and Hunter's studies suggest that three of the, the ones that they examined um, were cetacean bone. Bone or antler pommels are largely focused around the west of the Irish Sea. Uh, and most were found with cremated remains. The one wooden pommel was preserved in a wetland context in Ireland, not, seemingly not with a burial, and more wooden examples probably existed. One pommel was cast as part of, the, of a bronze handle, uh, and this was found in the River Thames. In the south, three class three pommels were made from amber. Now, some of the efficacy of these amber pommels probably relied on them being um, the same form uh, as bone pommels, but capturing other properties in their substance the colour and translucence of amber, with its origins in the east and the sea, from which the sun rises, its scarcity. We have a good record of, um, of one of these burials, the craft and cremation of what's probably a woman, wrapped in cloth in a grave at the Manson Barrow, with a complex array of grave goods in bronze, clay, chalk, gold, amber and shale. That pommel, pommel um, has signs of, uh, the one on the screen here, uh, has signs of fracturing too, suggesting it was removed from one handle and fitted onto another. Now, the burial mode uh, at the Manson Barrow, uh, the, the type of site, the range of surviving objects and materials all differ significantly from Starvey. And perhaps bone and, am and amber pommel seem quite different things, but on another level, um, there are important differences. They would all have been smoothed and polished. While there are um, pommels in bone, antler, amber, bronze and gold, there don't seem to be any in dark shale or jet, which is used in other media at this time. And I think that the bright cream, gold, amber and red spectrum might be crucial to understanding these knife handles. In that sense, perhaps the, the Manson pommel and that from Starby are, are <coughs> still things with some similar potency and effects within different regional assemblages. Um, and typology allows us to map not only uh, the similarities here, but some of the differences and some of the, re the regionality in what's going on. Now, work is only beginning um, to un understand that artifact and also to understand some of the others um, from the burial. But already, typology is playing a key role in starting this analysis, not in finishing it, but in, in thinking about it from the beginning. Beads uh, like these from the Starby burial, bottom left, <coughs> were commonly associated with female rather than male burials from this period and have been found with four other class three pommels. Top is a bone point. About three quarters of the bone points examined in Woodward and Hunter's project showed little or no evidence of wear on the tip, but some showed light wear around the perforation of a kind suggesting they were stitched onto um, a, gar a garment or headgear. Um, some have been found with inhumations buried close to the head. Again, typically in female graves. Typological similarities suggest comparator um, burials. So um, on the right there, um, there are two bone points and bone toggles from uh, a kiss just a couple of miles away on the Isle of Man with a food vessel um, urn. Uh, three individuals represented in that kiss at the Cronk Upper Lurgy Do. Um, Burial H at Beth Branwen. A uh, curved ring cairn on Anglesey consisted of a collardurn inverted in a small kist, and it contained cremated bone, a burnt bone bead, and at the mouth of the pot, a bone class three pommel snapped in half, and several unburnt jet and amber beads. The two urns are very similar, sharing a lightly incised collar decoration with a triangular and diagonal line motif. And I'd suggest we consider a similar type of burial sequence, um, and, and think about how the funerary events were similar, and the extent to which they differed. Overall, 10 of the burials with class 3 pommels included collared urns and one a food vessel um, with similar uh, decorative traits. Given that only one of the 20 other known pommels of other classes was found with a collared urn, this repeated correlation also seems to be significant. It's something we need to, to think more about as we do further analysis. Um, let's get through that. So that's my case for the continued use of conventional typologies 
to appreciate relationships between burials. But we can also develop typologies of other events alongside this, and I think we've been doing this. Typologies of events that transformed artifacts and bodies. Um, for example, um, Maria Zedinho's approach to Native American relational taxologies identifies a category of things, substances, and actions which carry special potency. And by their presence in an assemblage, they activate other things. And, she, and she's referring to um, paint, uh, smoke, and song, and it's painting, smoking, singing as ways of, of, of animating. Now, without importing that taxonomy into the early Bronze Age of the British Isles, we can think about the assemblages, the types of events that activated and changed things. Burning events, for instance, we can detect. We can also think about inlaying the impressions of collard on collardones with white paste, which we see. Prizing a pommel from the handle and placing it on top of an urn full of cremated bones, turning the urn upside down on a stone slab. We can think about how kists conceal the remains of the dead and also afford the possibility for their dramatic revelation in the future. In short, perhaps we can expand typology to include such acts, a typology of transformations. And I think that some of the recent work um, carried out by British prehistorians, such as um, Joe Brook and Andy Jones and Colin Richards, amongst others, on practices like wrapping and bundling uh, or, or cutting, all of these kinds of, um, of acts are effective alongside conventional typologies. They can't be um, linked to a single uh, type of evidence, but they're a, a different way about, of, of thinking about types of productive acts. Perhaps we can draw these approaches closer together. So when don't types matter? Oh, um, uh, yeah. um, well, things can be too varied to form uh, spatial clustering over a, a large area, or things can be too similar that, that it, doesn't, it doesn't reward uh, closer inspection. Um, early Bronze Age kists, for instance, don't seem to have a, a set typology, even though you can note variations in orientation, variations in size. But I think we can see some associations between different sizes and shapes and, and their contents, and other variables, such as whether or not they were backfilled, for instance. And I do want to look more closely at um, kissed types. And what about where we have objects that are seemingly uh, unique, or things that we've not seen before? Is typology of any use here? There were four of these bone objects um, uh, in the Starvey uh, cremation burial, each of the same type. I can't find any parallels for them, and any interpretations, any suggestions are most welcome. Typology can only describe them as a new type of thing and turn to experimental archaeology to explore how they were made, their properties and their potential uses and effects. We can see if they had similar histories of wear. We can look to analogies. We can think about how they fit in with the rest of the assemblage. But this is all part of how typologies take shape, how we fit typologies in with other, um, other relations that are important in, in the, uh, the life histories of the things. Perhaps these objects supported some shape to a garment, like the tags in my shirt collars. Perhaps they were part of a headdress. Perhaps their chiselled ends were used to finish and decorate pots or as scrapers for cleaning hides. All of the objects from Starvey need closer examination so we can consider these questions and explore their life histories. And we're going to do that from January onwards. And it will no doubt change our interpretation. But typology gives us a way in to most of these objects before we can study them in that closer detail. It tips us off to, th for, to things to record, to consider as similar and different as we look across, uh, as we look across the class um, of, of each type of thing. So in conclusion, typology forms one starting point, not an end point for interpretation. I think we do need to retain typology within a broader relational approach, which is committed to detailed description uh, and following the material. Typology can focus on both similarities and differences within a type, and it can work across a range of media uh, that are assembled together in things like burial practices. This approach to typology that I'm advocating applies to more than just artifacts or places because it stresses how similar productive assemblages, similar type of events, shape people, things, and places together. Now, not everything can be appreciated through typology. It's not equally relevant uh, to, tradition, to all kinds of traditions. But some relationships key to past ways of being in the world, past ways of becoming alive, dead, and remembered, ways of connecting to the past and to distant places and people, can. Rather than abandon typology, then, 
I think we need to think creatively about interweaving different typologies of events, acts and effects in order to further appreciate the character of the relationships that constituted past worlds. Thank you.